closer to the table. I think <coughs> Martin's finished, we can do some groups and you can see um, all the work on different letters and how it reacts and any question you have, you can just ask me. So I leave Daniel and I'm, I'm gonna start with the Latina. Well, can you just show the different letters you brought? To, yeah, um, so we have different like <coughs> alligator, we brought some lizard, um, different grain leathers, so we can show you how it reacts. Um, Cordovan, calf, yeah, have your good variety. And, well, and I have the boots that <laughs> we know, I do normally do not patina in front of the client. Yeah. But Tony's. Bit of pressure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so whilst Nuns is doing this, I'm going to tackle a subject of a word that we realized yesterday might not really exist or I've confused it with something else. But what it means is more important than what it is. And uh, this morning they had a lecture on finishing and how it increases the appearance of the product that you make. But I think finishing is second past this. And range is the blending of surfaces and components or areas of in this case, a shoe. Um, I've only ever seen these words in books from like 1910, 1930, and now range means a lot of different things. You can go to the drawing range, <laughs> like so. <laughs> um, you can have a range of shoes, you can have a range of sizes, but it's all um, a distance between two points, a small size to a large size, a wide width to a narrow width, um, and what separates good range from bad range is does these areas blend together harmoniously? Do they do so with purpose? Are they an accident? Are they made with intent? And it's something that can set apart quality, good handmade shoes to shoes that and make it look like a creation rather than something made. Um, and today with the internet, where everyone can see everybody's shoes more or less, customers are more educated. And this is something that they wouldn't pick up on and know that they like, but they know that it's there when it's there, and it looks good. It makes you feel good when you look at it. So I'm just going to make a few examples to explain why, what it looks like when it's right, what it looks like when it's wrong. Uh, and a few tips how to avoid giving your shoes bad range and what you can do to give them good range, if this makes sense. <laughs> so, range is transition between different lines, curves, and, cur and components. And I got to borrow these pictures from Jesper Shoegazing in uh, exchange for mentioning his blog here. <laughs> so he let me use these pictures of a shoe that he just acquired that has fabulous range. Um, I'm not going to mention who it is because then I'll have to mention the ones that have bad range. <laughs> and that might be uncomfortable. Might be a fight. And yeah, it might be a fight. <laughs> um, and range can apply to loss making, pattern cutting, closing, shoe making. And a good example of range is blending the heel with the waist with the forepart and uh, if you cut a curve does it have a continuous radius or does it look wobbly does it look squiggly like does it mean does it look like it was made with purpose and confidence or is there insecurities uh, in the execution from the craftsman um, good versus evil Good range, bad range. I um, don't know if you can see, read it, if it's large enough. Um, heel, waist, and forepart blend with confidence, purpose, and precision. Um, most of you that's made shoes, or people that are just starting out making shoes, <coughs> has probably experienced that it starts with a dream and ends with a nightmare. <laughs> and you have this vision in your head what it's gonna look like when it's finished. And when it's done and you look at it, it doesn't quite look like what you have in mind. <laughs> and the reason it doesn't look like that is because you don't know all the things you need to know. 
So if you're making a loss, for example, are you, are you creating a feather edge that gives uh, a circumstance and the right conditions to build the heel you want to build? If you want a heel that's very square and symmetric, does your loss allow for that? Or is there anything you're going to have to do during the making process, during lasting, heel stiffness preparation, insole preparation, to allow for the heel of your dreams to be applied to this shoe with success? Um, if you look at the, the heel, the seat of the heel should be symmetrical, it should be even, it should uh, it shouldn't be symmetrical, it shouldn't be a different height on the inside or the outside unless this is part of the vision or it's part of what's required to make it fit the person and the foot inside. Um, waist and forepart have a single radius. If your loss has a single radius, why doesn't your waist do so? And do you know why? I see a lot of shoes around that don't have it and I don't think it was on purpose and they don't know how bad it looks and that they're losing the opportunity to have their shoes in demand. So what do you mean specifically by single radius in that view? Well, for example, if I go back, we look at the waist, you can have multiple radius, but does it go down and does it go up on itself? Is this caused by a sky? Is it caused by cutting off a piece of leather that maybe you should have left in place? Anything like that. And you look at the forepart, maybe if you don't stitch straight, your welt is not going to sit in the same position to the next stitch and cause an up and down motion. And when customers look at your shoes, they ref they, in their mind, they may be used to buying high-end ready-to-wear shoes, cemented shoes, things like that. And when they see this, it looks messy to them. They don't, they don't, it doesn't create a, a feel of confidence that this person knows what they're doing. Um, so having this in mind and having this word in mind as a way of referring to it, it keeps it on your mind. You have a vocabulary that you can talk with within yourself and with craftsmen around you. Um, yeah, last night we I talked with Jim and he said he calls it flow. And that's probably actually what it is. Does things flow together? But I don't know if anybody would use the word flow in 1910. <laughs> um, maybe they did, but in a different context. Um, so we want things to flow together. And if you want it to flow together, you can use the word range. Um, around the toe area, we have problems with soles going a bit wibbly, wobbly around the toe. Maybe you didn't sky evenly. Maybe you hit your hammer harder on one side than you did the other. Maybe you put one ear stitch on a pleat and the other one in the depth, in next to a pleat, and they're not going to go around in an even circle. You might even cause some greening and showing of stitches that would be a bad thing. Um, the opposite of good range, lack of harmony, lack of integration. Um, they look like each part looks like it has nothing to do with the next part. The heel is separate to the waist, the waist is separate to the forepart. Bad skiving, you can have a part that's supposed to be have an invisible transition is visible to the naked eye. It causes bad range of the band when you have a poorly sky stiffener. Or maybe you don't use a side lining where you should have. Any questions? No. <laughs> that's probably a bad thing. <laughs> um, <coughs> here I have a shoe from an unnamed uh, brand whose website you might have visited. Uh, this for me, I would say, is not a terrible example. I brought some student work here, which would be a lot worse, but they at least have a good excuse. This firm, not so much. Um, it's quite hard to tell, but you can see the dip here, and it's also a gap above it which means this could have been push, pushed up and created a nicer harmony. Or maybe they could have skived it better. Or maybe they could have added leather behind the sky to make the transition shorter and less apparent. Um, 
the wealth is kind of going up here and then it's going down, which means that the toe puff is impacting the position of the wealth, most probably. And it could have been probably dealt with with a hammer, but maybe there was time for, no time for that. Maybe the person doing the shoe wasn't at this room today. <laughs> um, and living a blissfully ignorant life of this concept. Uh, and maybe uh, he has no shame, <laughs> no motivation, <laughs> finds dignity in other parts of his life. <laughs> this is supposed to be a little bit funny. <laughs> um, what gives good range? Good preparation. <coughs> you know the shoe you want to make in your mind, and you need to make a strategy on how to get it to that uh, point by the end of it. Uh, there's a spelling, not a spelling thing there. <laughs> um, there's various techniques that you can use. It's a, uh, an acknowledging the fact that people respond to this, and if you know they're looking for it, you will automatically do a better job at it because you want to sell a pair of shoes so you can pay your bills. Um, and it sets you apart from other shoemakers and ready to wear shoes. It's very, not everybody is a shoe nerd or knows the things that we know about shoes. And it's a lot easier to sell a shoe to a person if they respond to it emotionally without having it to be explained to them why they should like it or why it doesn't look perfect. Oh, it's handmade. Bad handmade looks handmade. Good handmade looks created, like it came out of the atmosphere and it was meant to be that way. Um, if it's wobbly and all over the place, maybe like, you know, like uh, Lisa was saying, rustic, you know, it's one thing if it looks rough, but if you try to justify it with, uh, with it being your artistic vision after you fail, if you go at it with the intent of making it rustic, maybe that's one thing. If you make a mistake and say, oh, well, you know it's handmade. That's how you tell it's handmade. It's a sign of the hand, sign of the craftsman. Nonsense. <laughs> no, it's, it's much better to avoid this conversation and just do it right to begin with. Um, and you don't have to get there straight away, but if you keep pursuing it, you will, you will get it. So, toes, very sensitive to range issues. This toes looks a little bit clown-like. Um, it's quite dark, but there's a lot of issues between the weld, the stiffeners. Um, there's slightly different styles of toe, but you can still see how straight it is, that it's not deterring from its uh, direction and, and it knows where it's going. The person that made the one on the left there maybe didn't think it matters so much. Um, or they're cheaper shoes, there's no time to spend on them. And that's okay. But if you're aware that these things are around, maybe there's things that you could do without spending more time to make it look like you spent more time on it and therefore giving the, the impression of greater value. Good example of bad heel range. The seat of the heel is pointing downwards followed by a waist that goes upwards um, and there's a little bit of a stance issue there as well and it's sharing the same kind of toe shaped issues as uh, the last pair had. Um, some people like something softer, less refined, um, and that's okay, but I think in the, in the game of high-end shoemaking that where most of us would be considered to be in, something more refined has greater success. And here are two different insoles of the, I think the one on the left would have been on the red shoe. And if you look at the feather edge, it's just cut at an angle and it's an acceptable technique and it works, but it creates great issues when trying to achieve a great range. 
because it's extremely sensitive to the exit uh, uh, area of the awl. If you move it up and down a few millimeters, it's sitting at an angle and it's going to create a waviness. If you have a square edge with a hold fast further away, you can actually stitch pretty badly and it will not show because the eye is drawn to the feather edge which is over here and the stitch would be over here, safe from causing issues with the, with the visual appearance. And all you gotta do is sand a little bit and scrape a little bit and those lumps and bumps will be gone. Um, while I'm, before I'm running out of time, I'm going to send out a few shoes here into the crowd. This one, I would say, has fairly poor range and it was made by a student for practice. You can see lumps and bumps, asymmetric heels, and uh, sewing irregularities. So I'll pass this on to Bill. Same with this one, which is made by a professional shoemaker, and it shares some of the same issues. <laughs> These are our samples, by the way, so it's, we're not throwing sticks and stones at other people. And then I thought I'd grab a shoe that I would find had exquisite range, which was made by uh, a shoemaker that used to work for Gassiano Berlin when I worked where I started. <coughs> and I never knew why I thought it was so beautiful. And then when I found the word range, I knew that it explained a lot of what's good about it. Because when you look at it, even though it's a 10-year-old sample with lumps and bumps caused by poor handling, it still looks refined, precise, and made by somebody that's in control. Um, and I forgot how much the word meant to me when I first started, but when I, the first two years that I knew of this concept, it was what I, what, what I was striving for the whole time. And a lot of apprentices that I teach now, they get extremely focused on finishing as being a smooth, shiny surface. But these smooth, shiny surfaces can actually look worse when they're on an uneven surface or with an irregular surface, because you have a lot of uh, surface, because you have reflections that love these lumps and bumps and, and highlight them. And this shoe is actually quite matte and flat in appearance, but it's still perfect. And just to help explain that shoe, here's a half-finished shoe made by the same person. And you can kind of see the, how level the insole preparation is. And I'm going to give myself some bragging rights. So this is the <laughs> shoe I made last year that got the second place in the World Championship of Shoemaking. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the intent with this shoe is, was to make a simple shoe that focuses on range. Um, and I'll let you be the judge if you think that it follows this concept well. Um, I think the next picture says kill time. <laughs> um, but no, something I wanted to mention was a lot of people here, just like me, love image, vintage images of footwear. Old catalogs, 1910, 1920, up to the 50s. Most of these shoots, it would be impossible to see if they're well fill it, finished or not, because they're pure illustrations. But what they do have is perfect range, because they're not affected by pure craftsmanship, because they're prints. Their drawings yeah. and uh, not as challenging to work with as leather. Um, and everyone loves these shoes because they're so sharp and crispy clean, uh, and they look like they um, they just the skies opened and they came down and were handed to somebody <laughs> worthy. Um, and I think that's what both shoemakers should strive to do. And if you actually make good range, you can have spend less time on your finishing. They will still look great. You can have a rough, you can sand it with a hundred grit paper and have, as long as those marks are even, the eye will be drawn to the, to the, 
the precision of the build rather than the, 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 the imperfections of the surface. Um, <coughs> so after this, does everybody know what range is? If anybody wants to come forward without watching news, they're welcome. You can crowd around, sit down, watch what she's doing. Feel free. The closer you get, the better she will work. We did it last year with talk leather, how the leather reacts. So the whole idea is that you can see that you don't need to have every color. I have everything like this, all these colors. Even like, you can see here the transition from this one, they can put the white. So having this color, like you actually an alligator like nice the dyes and the colors, so you can make it's different ways of doing it. You can just like put one layer on, just soak it all, have the same color. Or I normally work with like the scales one by one. So, so for instance with this one. So this is So you have to work on very, very light coats of colour there, aren't you? The thing is, like, you, you want the, the brush to be nearly dry, because then you have the control of how much ink you put it into the leather. And, and also, I wanted to show you, like, for instance, like, this takes great the ink. Uh, Lisa takes really good the ink. Um, this is a piece of coat of leather. So the whole idea is to show, in this case, because it's quarter, I'll, I'll take blue, it doesn't really matter the color. We let it dry. As you can see already, like it's kind of changing, but it's not taking much. It shows you, you might be able to start working like in, with a new leather, something that you never worked before. Um, you think that you're doing a great job, you carry on, finish the whole shoe, and then you apply the cream, and everything that you've done comes off. So normally, that's why it like, you can try with different leather. I will always pick a piece, do a test, check how it's absorbing the color, and then you put cream at the end. If the color holds and everything works, it's fantastic. If the leather has any kind of like surface on top, like aniline leathers, um, Cordoba, it's not gonna take the color. And that was the whole idea of showing today how different leather reacts. Like in this case, I'm gonna let this dry and then I'm gonna trim it. I'm gonna use some patch grain, which works in a very similar way. Jonas, could you tell us a bit about the dyes? I normally use some of these dyes. They work quite well. Um, that would be the dark that we normally use. Yeah. It's a permanent dye, so once the leather absorbs uh, the color, the color normally doesn't come off. Like some people will tell you, like, oh, with the years and everything, like the colors become. Most of the times, because they're not cream properly, you should cream them and then, you know, it gets absorbed. Uh, 
is, what's the solvent for it? Is it alcohol to? It's alcohol based. Yeah, okay. So you can see in here, I'm, I'm trying like, this is like, um, it's a grain, it's calf leather, but because of the grain and the layers that put on top, I'm trying to kind of blend the color and I can feel that the brush is kind of melting on top. So it got start. And it does when you really want to get in. So now I let this one dry and I'm gonna taste those two and then finally it's just a normal like yeah. Should I use a match to show so Yeah. And keep 
Push, it pushes yeah, off. And can, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Take it off. Yeah. yeah. That's not gonna happen. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what? This is what I'm kind of. Oh, that's the Russian. Yeah, yeah. This, this one is. Um, it's a grain. It's a, yeah, um, yeah. a kind yeah. of like hard grain, but obviously because the top layer is coated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't want to accept. So you can see also in here. This is doing like it's having like a reaction. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Put this one there. The normal really with kind of leather yeah. is not gonna. Yeah. It's yeah. not gonna happen. That's why it's always good to do a test beforehand. Take like just a little piece. More them are fine. You can tell sometimes only looking at the leather if it has like a shiny finish. Do you ever try to take away the finish so that you can reach the diet or is that a bad you idea? You can try with this one but it's gonna kind of lose and then it's not gonna lose. It just takes nice. away from the leather. Yeah it does. So for that it's just better like, to use a kind of leather that has no finish and has nothing and then you can once you put me and polish you're gonna get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You kind of like, I, I don't like to use aggressive products to kind of clean the leather and it, it takes off and then when it ages with time, the leather becomes a bit drier and it's like sleeping you know, hair, I guess. Exactly. Right? You don't want because then when you're doing something that is going to affect the leather in the long term. So you want like, already like this as like a um, and with your with your cream, if you have a clear one, is there a difference? I mean, um, can you can can you just put it clear if you yeah, wanted you just can. that color? Yes, you can. You can keep it. Even the clear one is it's gonna change. It's like it's gonna darken it slightly. The patina that you put it on, but you always want like I normally use the same color of the cream of the contrast that I'm using. Like I would use here dark blue. Yeah. I would use here dark blue. Too. I would use brown. If this has only a base color, like for instance in here, like I would use like also instead of like the burgundy. And it's the same like this kind of same in here. I, I yeah, I pick up the blue one because I would I thought I was gonna have time. Um, <laughs> that's what I'm doing, everything with blue. <laughs> Um, but now you can really nearly do everything. I think that was the same you were last year at the convention. Yeah. So it was mostly like people and, you know, and probably only like a few leathers. And you can only have like, as I said, like this is one color and not this. It's just like the way of like explain that some leathers, you can see in here, like this is not taking the color. And we can try, like, can carry on, as you said, try to, the more we do, that kind of coat is going to start blending all over, and then you kind of like, it's going to be a battle, and then we're going to cream it, and everything's going to come off. And then you, yeah. Where, where is this crosshatch from? Because I have some from... Um, this is just... Yeah, no, because I have some for Halloween, the boots yeah. that I'm wearing, yes. and it takes the color way different than this. this so it's one. just very interesting yeah. it's how they're kind of finished. Like, it definitely does something. It does, and, and you can kind of go away with if you only want to do one color. Yeah, you yeah. could. If the idea is to do like some patina, yeah. like yeah. contrast, yeah, yeah. Um, you're not going to have it with this. Yeah, yeah, no. Because you're not going to control with, in, with this, like with the cross leather, you kind of control where you want to put yeah. it. And that has to be also with like having the brush in your yeah. You control how much you want to put. You start blending slow. It's better to make a better decision. It's the last thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you start saying that we are with dying it first. And you have no thing. So you're going to end up with a cord in your black. Maybe like you want to blend like in the middle and then this part here is going to absorb everything and it's just going to be all absorbed. So we're not going to do that for like very you can. It's like they, they have also yeah, like some lightening kind of colors that would allow you to do it. They just gotta commit. 
uh, you just have to breathe twice and then it's like it all comes like after a while it all comes kind of natural like if you think it too much you are gonna put too much and that's also why when we do exactly and that's why we do it like one of the secrets that people see is like if I put a lot of it I'm gonna have it done quicker as I mean say it's not true <laughs> Yeah, that's easy to work. Yeah. 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 Ye